have seen, some things you might have seen, and uh, we'll have some time for questions as we go or at the end if there's anything you want me to go into more detail. I'm going to spend most of the time doing demo um, rather, than, rather than slides. I prefer demos. I prefer watching demo, them. I prefer conducting them. Uh, but I have a couple of slides to, before we get started. Um, so, demo features. We're going to go through some new noteworthy things and some upcoming things at the end, which I, are part of the demo. Uh, before I get started, some of the things I'll be showing are, are using the CDT indexer. Now, the CDT indexer has been around for, for quite a long time now. It's been around for about 10 years. Um, if you didn't know already, the CDT indexer has a, a full model of the code. It enables all of the advanced editing, searching, auto-completion features of CDT, and it's a really powerful thing. Now, it's actually pretty damn powerful, and at the moment, um, some guys at Google are actually taking the CDT index, and they've made a copy of it, and it's going to be the new JDT index. And I, I think that says quite a lot about the, 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 the base quality of, of a lot of the CDT stuff, that you know, it, that's going to be the next new JDT index once, it, once it's all done. It just got merged. The first chunk of it got merged just a few weeks ago. And uh, Stefan Zenos from Google, he's around here as well. So if you, if you want to chat more about that. Also, we're benefiting because he's finding a few, a few little bugs here and there. And he's, they've been coming back into CDT. So some stability improvements in CDT. All right, let's get right into the demo. So, a lot of the time, these, de these demos use really trivial, simple projects. One, one line functions, one thing like that. Um, I thought we'd just, we'd just push CET a little bit more. We'd show, show it being used on a, on a full-size application. My other passion is Python. And so, um, I thought what we'd do today is look at all the features around using it with, to debug Python itself. Now, I mean, by Python itself, I mean the actual Python interpreter, which is itself, itself written in C. Um, you, can get, you can check this, this demo out from GitHub. Um, and it's got the setup instructions on how to set up your, your project. For today, I'm using Python 3.4. Um, but in principle, use it whatever Python you like. So, one of the important parts of getting the indexer to work is having the scanner set up properly so, the, so that the CDT understands how your, your project is laid out. If you're using a full managed build system, you don't need to do that. The full managed build system will take care of that for you. As you add an include path to the compiler settings, you'll end up with the include path added to the indexer information so it knows where to look for header files. But if you're using an existing project or, or make file project or you don't want to use managed build set settings for whatever reason, and there are lots of reasons not to, um, you, can, you can use, you can configure anything manually to set it up. Or you can actually configure it semi-automatically. Semi-automatically means you actually run the build from within CDT. CDT will parse the command lines that are being passed to GCC and say, oh look, there's a dash I. So that means that's an include directory to use. Oh, there's a dash D, so we'll add that to the defined, and it will pick all of those, all of those settings up for you automatically. So, when make one time inside, at the beginning of your project inside CDT, and it'll pick, it'll pick everything up, and then you can fine tune it as necessary. You might need to fine tune it per file, per project, per folder. All, all of these many variables are available to you. Um, it's just deciding for your project what's the right one. So, for example, for the, for the Python, if you go into, oh, where is it? I don't remember where I put it. All right. So here's how it, it collects all the, all the various settings. So it's picking up the compiler built-in settings here. And it's showing you here the command that's going to run to find out all the stuff that GCC provides. Where does GCC call its, in get its includes from? Where does GCC set up as you know, all the hundreds of different defines? 
here's the, the build output parser. So we run the build, this is where the output that you get. And it, this is using to, to identify what the command lines, which are GCC, and how to store all that information. So now, once you have this all set up properly, what you should end up with is you, you end up going into the correct, for example, stdio.h file. So here I have a, a host application, which is Python. So as you sh can see there, that stdio is user include stdio, as you'd expect. Now over here, I have a, a different project in the same workspace at the same time, which is targeting an, an, an ARM project. If I open that one up, and I control click on stdio to open it, as you can see, it's opened a separate one. If we zoom in on it a bit, we should see that we're using the ARM stdio.h. So all this can happen simultaneously, and the, the, you can set it up so there are no conflicts. Okay, so now one of the features that was added a few years ago, um, and some people will have seen it, some people will will have fallen over it, some people will have embraced it, is the C, C, C++ code analysis. Now that's called code and for short. And one of the features that was just added for Neon was the ability to, to fine tune some of, the, some of those errors and some of those warnings that it generates. If, for example, you have a bit of code that you're happy with how you wrote it, or the code end doesn't identify it properly, you can individually suppress that warning and that error without losing that rule for your whole project or your whole workspace. So I have an example from within Python. So Python here has this using a semicolon for an empty block. Code end considers that bad practice because maybe that that semicolon is hiding the, the, the real block. Now you can fix this sort of as the code end thinks the proper way by using an empty block in some form. Or, let me just go get the line. You can use the new suppress comments to suppress that semicolon. And you see now the warnings disappeared. Now, while we're here, I just want to show you another great new feature of CDT. Now, over here we have a few different things happening in this call. And you've probably seen, let me just zoom. We have this icon here, which it's got a breakpoint, a warning, a to-do, all those icons stopped on top of each other. And you go, what's going on? Traditionally, if you hover over that, then it'll get, give you a pop-up that lists, lists all of them. So one of the improvements we've made now is when you hover over it, it expands all, all of these icons. So you can see exactly what those icons are, hover over each one of them, and know that you're triggering the behavior of those individual icons rather than the guesswork of the, of, of the non-expanded one where there's two or three things. How do you make it do what you want? So here I can click on the to-do, and it will go highlight the to-do for me. <coughs> Now, quickly back to, back to the warnings. Now, wh wh one, one fe obvious feature request is we should have control one support to add the warnings. And at some point, especially if someone contributes it, that will be the case. In the meantime, if you're trying to figure out what, what exactly that, that string that has to go in the at suppress is, with, with the error message you have, you can go into preferences, into C++ code analysis, it's already highlighted here because I did it before, but you can type the error message and it will show you the settings. From within the settings, you can customize it and here's the suppression comment to use to turn off the suspicious semicolon. Um, and you can change potentially your suppression comment. If you do change your suppression comment, make that change in your project, probably instead of your workspace, so you can share it with everybody else. Now, 
as I already mentioned, the indexer is a really great tool. That it's what makes it an IDE instead of a text editor, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and there's a, there's a number of views that you may, you may not have ever used before. So the first one is the include browser. So um, if you try and find a view, you can go window, show view, blah, 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 and it's a few clicks. Or preferably press quick access or, pre or press control three to get there and then just start typing. So you know, type a few letters and it's going to find the view for you much faster. So the include, the include view, so here we're focused on python.h. It shows ev everything that python.h includes, and we can expand and follow, follow that through the whole system to find stuff. And we can find everything that includes python.h. So it's a, one extra little tool to help. Another view is you want to be able to see what the indexer has, what information the indexer has inside it. And that's the index view. So index, open that up. And with the index view, we can see all the, all the main symbols that, that are, are in there. So these are some small projects. And I'm doing small projects on purpose because while the index is really fast, creating all of the tree items to expand this tree, because it's not virtual at the moment, um, takes a bit too long. And if I, expand, if I expand the Python one any more than this, we'll just have to wait a couple minutes for, for Eclipse to catch up to us. Now, I'm pretty sure you've all used search. But I have a quick show you. C++ search. Another thing that's using the index very fast, it's showing you line number. It's showing you for what the, what the container of it is. So in this case, the file, uh, file IO write is contained within this structure called file IO methods. And that leads us to the next view, which is call hierarchy. So we can see for file IO write, we can see all the methods it's calling and all the methods calling it. Now here, file IO write isn't showing anything calling it because we have field accesses off. And the only access is within the method. So by turning field access on, then we can see where file IO write is accessed within, um, within that structure. So all, all those things basically give you those more advanced features over just doing grep with all of its false negatives um, and should really speed up the development time of C++. As a lot of you guys put your hands up as, as CDT extenders. You're all used to using this stuff in Java. And so we're here to remind and, and enlighten about that CDT has, has a lot of these features too. So a, a really good place where um, it becomes really important is here I have a, a cut down bit of C++. Of course, if you grep overloaded in C++ in this case, you're going to get a lot of cases. But if you want to see where the, the double version is called, call hierarchy understands that, and it just shows that one. And that, that's one of the, the main areas where the indexer really starts com coming on into its own. Now, we're very fortunate at the moment. There's some, some quite active contributors, both because the index is being ported to CDT, uh, from CDT to JDT, so we're getting bug fixes back. And we have some very active contributors at the moment who are improving the quality of, of the parsers, the indexers, for especially the advanced C++ features. I'm not particularly a, a C++ programmer, but if you're into all the newest C++ standards and things like auto types and complicated other bits, we're seeing improvements all the time. But the other part is that the current contributors in that area are very active. So if you have problems in that area, please raise them, and we can get, we get them fixed. Even if you can't contribute to fix, even if it's a bit overwhelming, just a minimal test case that shows a problem, we can make, we can make those steps forward and improve it even better. Now one of those places where th th those improvements are happening and the benefit is is a new feature that came in just a few weeks ago in Neon, Neon Point 1 CDT, which is, uh, which is CDT 9.1. And it's a uh, parameter guessing. Now, if you're used to the JDT, 
when you complete parameters, it will, in the drop-down list, show you t properly typed options. And CDT in the past has only just shown you the variable name that the receiving function has declared. But now, C CDT has, has the feature too. So this function here takes a couple of structs, and if I complete it, I'm getting the choices. I have a struct and a pointer to a struct declared, and it knows to, 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 add, to add the star where it's needed or not. So that's a really nice step forward. Understands different types too. So, so for OV1, which takes an integer and that struct, it's got an integer, my in, all my integer variables are there as the first choice, and uh, my struct and my struct pointer as, as the other choice. All right. Now, my personal interest is, is in debug, so I, I'm, I'm quite fond of all the, of debug. Don't know how many of you have extended debug yourself, you've added stuff to DSF, perhaps you've even added stuff to CDI in the past. So I'm just going to run through some of the, the features of, of debug with you. Um, for that, I'm going to be debugging Python. So let's, let's have a go at it. So now, I always now use the launch bar. So that's, that's up here. Um, as you can see, I don't I got rid of all, most of my other icons. Don't really use many of the other toolbar icons up there. So having them, that one just doesn't go away without right now. So I, I just left it. But you know, the, the, this this is the, the toolbar I need all the time. Um, I'm not doing any remote debugging, but if you have remote debugging, you get an extra nice little bar. And if you went to Doug's talk. Um, yesterday, you would have had a chance to see some, some more of the launch bar in action. So, let's, yes? Is this available in the Neon.1? Yes, it's in Neon, Neon.1. It's, um, it's a separate feature it, to, to install called launch bar. So, so let's uh, go off and, and debug Python. All right, so first simple one, run to line. I'm going to mostly show the menu options for everything because they're a bit easier to remember. Telling you all the keyboard shortcuts for everything today probably will be in one ear out the other. So, um, but most everything has keyboard shortcuts and of course um, Eclipse has a way to, to change those. So run to line, nice simple one, I get to get to that line. I can skip over all the other stuff. Don't have to set up a breakpoint first, then hit continue, one, just one step. Now, when we do stepping here in this nested function call, see, so first we call set locale, and then we, then we call this pi mem, we end up stepping in here. I didn't actually care about that part, so we step out, then we step back in, into over here, and things don't do what, exactly what we wanted. Actually. All oh, right, I don't have my I don't have the source for set locale here, so it didn't step into it. Let me show you what I was going to show you anyway. So to avoid stepping into, you know, the, the, the function calls which are parameters and things like that, you can right click on the function that you're interested in, and oops, and you can step into selection, and that will run and step just into that function and skip all automatically step and step return from all the other functions it, it gets into on, the, on its way there. So that saves us having to do lots of step in, step returns on, on complicated code. On C++, um, you end up having this more often as you have lots of little getter methods to ac access everything. Um, if you didn't know, JDT has the same feature. All right. So you see, we're, we're running. We're running Python here. We are, we are running Python. Oh, we're stopped at a. That's why. We are, we're running Python here. So we have our, our, our terminal here. And I've put a breakpoint inside the inner write method of, of Python, which is in file IO. 
let me just remind myself exactly what I wanted to show you here. Okay. So now we're in fi file I.O. We, ha we have this, this pbuff. Now, pbuff's buffer itself is actually a void star, which means that GDB doesn't really know what to do with you it and doesn't show you any of the information. But if you want, you can just right, whoops, you can just right click on it and choose cast a type and say, well, actually, I know in this case it's, it, I can treat it as a char star. Now as a char star, it's showing me the hello EC as I expect. And then if I want to have that for the future saved, one way to do it is to right click on, on that inner part and press watch. Let me just do that again with it clear so you can see what's happening. Watch, and then it's made, it's made the expression for you. So the char star p buff dot buff. And make this all a little bit narrower. So you can see it understands and knows it there. All right. Let me show you a little bit of, of disassembly. I know a few of you guys are extending for embedded people, and embedded people tend to like disassembly um, quite a bit. And the disassembly view is one of those views in Eclipse that I, I, I particularly like. And I, let me do a few steps to show you why. So I've turned on this instruction stepping mode. And when we do the steps over here, what's really nice is it, is it fades into the background, the old, the old instructions that were there. Uh, one of the, I think this is new in, in Neon, is you can hover now over the registers and get and find out what their value is, saving you from having to go expand and cross-reference it yourself. So it's a li nice little improvement like that. Now we're dealing with memory here, so let's have a let's have a closer look at at memory. Let me just. All right. I, I'm actively working on trying to fix a bug with GDB 7.12, which just came out. So I'm just going to revert to 7.11 for a second and uh, to, really, to really see the power here of, of it. OK. So in the memory browser, If I, if I put in my location of pbuff, you see here it's got, um, the, it's got the normal memory thing, but it's got see these pur all these purple lines and the annotations. So we now, the memory browser now has cross-referencing. Now, the cross-referencing of the memory means that just that it's going to start annotating the memory view with what you can see there. You can turn that on and off for variables and registers. And so this, that's the pbuff struct. If we want to look at the buff field in it, now if I, I remember right, I think that's the address, but no, it wasn't. So if I do the pbuff, then we see hello ECE in the memory. But where this gets quite interesting, especially if you're dealing with some small stack systems, is uh, pop in the stack pointer. I'll just make that bigger so you can see it. And there's the, that, that's showing you the stack pointer, all, all your variables on the stack that you have. And as I walk, let's see if I can make this bigger so we can all see it. As we walk the stack, in the debug view, we can see the next frame up, go to the frame before that, and we, you, can, you can see the stack growing just like that. There's the next frame, et cetera. So I believe that's a, a really nice new feature that was added in Neon as well, if you haven't seen it before. So 
So, all right, so the next thing sh I want to show you is um, another feature added a little while ago now, but you might, might not have come across it, is uh, dynamic printf. Now, dynamic printf is a, a, a breakpoint type, but it's a, really? It's a breakpoint type. Um, so if I go into my print here, let's see, and I add a dynamic printf breakpoint, I can put whatever for extra formatting string at once. So every time it hits that breakpoint, instead of stopping, it's going to do a, a printf of that. So this is on that same in, inner right. And you see here, that's, the, that's my printf string that it's going to do. Now, apparently I've been taking a bit longer than I want. I, have, I, I had some more demo stuff I'd like to show you. And if you're, if you're interested, I'd, I'd like to spend some time with you. The, the next big part I was going to show was um, simultaneously debugging uh, the Python program within, within the Python interpreter as the um, Python interpreter itself and show debugging multiple languages simultaneously. But instead, I'm just going to come back to, the, to our presentation um, and go over some of the other new and noteworthy features that are, are upcoming. Now, earlier this year, um, or with Neon, was the first major new release of CDT since, well, for about five years. Now, as a major new release, it meant that we could finally break some APIs. And didn't break very many, but the one big one that we broke is that we removed the CDI debugger. Um, some of you, that may have affected some of you, um, but the DSF debugger is, act, is actively being maintained, and nobody was contributing to CD, CDI debugger for, for quite a while. Um, and so it's been removed. It's a, it's a big, large piece of code to remove. So come see me if you want to, to uh, if you need any help migrating to DSF, we'd be happy to, to advise. The, de the CET dev forum is quite active, and there are lots of people there who, who I'm, I'm sure would be happy to help. One of the other nice new features in, in Neon, I think it's nice because I, I did it, so it has an effect, uh, is that the source lookup was significantly re refactored. Um, and this means that there's a lot of places that source lookup used to just not be able to work that now work. So um, all those places with X's, we've moved them to nice green ticks. So hopefully. Some of these use cases, maybe you'd fallen over on in places where source lookup wasn't working right for you. Um, now, there's lots of new cases where it does. Now, there's some, some ongoing features. Um, Docker support was added into CDT a, a while ago, and a lot of new features are being worked on. It's, it's, an, actively, it's an actively maintained and supported area. Um, I think one of the things that's upcoming in that area is debugging remote Docker containers from your machine. At the moment, it supports only a Docker container on the same physical machine that you're running on. Another new feature that's, that's coming out in CDT 9.2, just around the corner, is um, full G the full GDB console. Now, what the GDB folk have done, starting in GDB 7.12, which came out within the last li couple weeks, um, is the ability for GDB through a separate pipe back to the ID to provide a, the, a full console. So a lot of the CET users out there, or rather maybe not the CET users, like to use GDB at the console because they're used to it. They can debug really quickly. They know how to, they can type S and enter, enter, enter much faster than pressing buttons. And th this, should, this should onboard a lot of people into CDT because it is a true, exactly the same experience you have using GDB at the command line, plus all the GUI around it. So, uh, as our systems get bigger, uh, we have more and more threads, more and more cores. So, one of the other features within debug is the ability to start grouping threads and processes and stuff so that you can operate on subgroups 
um, all, all in one go. So you can say, let's grab these two threads and we're going to stop them in a pair or we're going to continue them and, and, and things like that. Um, macro support, it's, it's coming. Now, macro support isn't CDT specific, but there's a lot of, of advantage use, uses in CDT. And I'm going to plug my talk that's later, it's at 4.15 in here, I think. At 4.15 in here, and we're showing how to, to, do, to macro up your, uh, your Eclipse environment. Um, so you can write m more complicated launches by being able to write them in, in Python and say, well, launch my server, launch my client. Once th those bits are up, launch the third thing, tear it all down when you're done with just one button in the ID. And uh, Doug's been working on the new build system. And so we're getting support for CMake. We're getting support for, for QT. Um, we're getting new project wizards and lots of stuff. Hopefully you've seen Doug's presentation yesterday. Um, follow, follow along on the CDT dev for, for more. Now, a number of people in this room I know are interested in improving breakpoint quality. There's, there's a lot of active discussion at the moment. And early, early this year, we started uh, called a working group on trying to improve breakpoints for multi-core. So please come help get involved, and let's make CDT the, the class leader on how to do multi-core debug. Finally, CDT summits. We have, we're, all, we're all starting to get together in the same room, and that, that's really useful. In the, la, in the last year, 12 different companies have, have participated across the three different summits. We've had 30 different developers, committers, con and contributors. Um, we had one this week. We had one at EclipseCon North America, and there's a CDT summit in Ottawa. So hopefully, one of, in, in the future, one of them will be close to you, and uh, y you can join us. Share your use cases. Even if you're not, uh, not a committer, share your use cases. The committers want to understand how people are using the tools so that we can all go in the right direction together. All right, CDT has a lot of great features. There's a lot more coming. The community is active. Let's keep it, keep it going that way. And uh, let me know what you thought of my talk. Um, I'm an engineer, so I appreciate honest feedback. So thank you very much. Is there any questions before you go or grab me and I'd be happy? Yes. So one question for guys for talk. Yeah, that's okay. So as a matter of course, I use the launch bar for, for launching and debugging all my Java and PDE work and, and CDTs and PyDev and everything. So it, it is just, it is, I, I use that now instead of the, the old launch configuration buttons fully. So it's not specific, it's not specific to CDT, but you can leverage additional features and CDT is the first project, I guess, leveraging those additional features that the launch bar provides that the old launch configurations didn't do on their own. So, all right, thank you. Oh, yes? Thank you.